Contrast uncut, yeah you know that's us Where we only speak the real and the real rock with us Where we motivate the people and politic on success Oh no we ain't DJ Kelly, but they swear we the best Con What's happening? It's Contrast Uncut, it's season 5, it's episode 43 Sheesh! I want to give a huge shout out to Uncle Snoop's Army And Bobby D Presents, I appreciate you brothers it's your host, Zylo, and today, ladies and gentlemen, we have an incredibly dope special guest. He's legendary. He's from the IE, Inland Empire, Rancho Cucamonga, California, to be exact. He's a pioneer in the LA music scene, managing the likes of DJ Head, Chuck Fizzle, Radio Pioneers when it comes to Homegrown, 1500 and Nothing co-founder, My Guy Mars, just to name a few. His brother was behind the scenes a national syndicated radio show, Homegrown Radio, and has guided countless talents through the trenches of this music industry. He's an ally. With 20 years plus in the game, he delivers wisdom, a pure diamonds, and a heart of gold. And if you don't know who I got on the show by now, it's all good. We get all episode to chop it up with the man himself, Brian Salas. How you doing, Salas? I'm good. I'm good. How you doing, man? I'm blessed and highly favored, you know. I got to tell you from the jump, time's the most finite thing we have on this earth. I got to tell you, I appreciate you for fucking with me and fucking with the viewers. Thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure to be here. So, Salas, brother, what's a normal 24 hours for you? What's a normal 24 hours for me? Ah, that's a good. Actually, you know what? That doesn't exist because uh, every day is kind of like different. Um, you know what I'm saying? So I always tell people. Um, my plans are written in pencil, right? Meaning that, you know, they can change at the drop of a dime and, and whatnot. But, you know, typically, like, it's, it's like if a typical day is, you know, I wake up, I don't know, eight-ish in the morning, um, come up to my office, you know, this room right here, you hop on computer, do some admin stuff, um, you know, checking on emails, you know, text messages, phone calls, do a lot of stuff here. Till about uh let's say early afternoon uh and whatnot and then at that point i'll probably then if i have anything that i got to do in the city because i live in long beach anything i got to do in the city i'll you know I'll hop in the car drive into the city and, and take care of my meetings sessions um meet things that i got to do with either like dj head or, or or my guy mars something like that and so you know do that and then that can go all the way into you know the middle of the night and then i come back you know to the house and do it all over again <laughs> you know what the blessing about hearing that is that your day revolves around consistency of the workflow yeah you know, a lot of people think that they can get stuff overnight and and make a dream overnight but the only thing that comes overnight is sleep you gotta exactly. put the work in with every moment every minute that you have so that your 24 hours add up and hearing your day and that's the only consistent things you gave us was that you're going to work, come in that room, and you're going to get out and go mess with, you know, the talent that you manage. And at the same time, you're going to build relationships across the board. And yeah. that's something that people sleep on is that you got to put the work in. And so, you know, my days are kind of like a lot of times two days in one. Right. So the first half is, you know, here in my office doing admin stuff or whatever. Right. And then the second half is me, you know, running the streets, you know, doing whatever I got to do. So when I look back, sometimes I don't remember what happened on what day, you know what I'm saying? Like, because it's like I had two days in one, you know what I'm saying? Because you know, even being here in, in, in my office, if I go from like, let's say eight to like, you know, two in the afternoon doing stuff here. And then I jump in the car and then I'm, you know, I'm running, I'm in LA from like three to like midnight or whatever. I mean, that's a long ass day. Right. Yeah. Well, both of those were like long stretches. And so that's why I'm like, Sometimes I like, I don't remember if that was Monday, Tuesday. When did I talk to such and such? You know, I'm saying I don't because it's like I, too many. It's like I'm having too many days within a day. Come on. No, I definitely relate to that because I get lost in my days. They'll just start to run into each other and, they you run know, into each other for sure. If it wasn't for a calendar on my phone, then then, you know, my structure would be a little bit more lost when it comes to compartmentalizing. <laughs> very much so. Very much so. I gotta make sure I give you your flowers from one dedicated father to another. I gotta shout you out and just, you know, give you that accommodation respectfully as a dedicated father, because as I was blessed to see you on countless sets, I was able to last time see you bring your kids. And yeah, you saw me bring my girls, yeah. And I thought that was a huge thing because I brought my son 
And, and I thought that was really dope because it's important to, you know, expose your kids to environments so that they can see what a set looks like. They can see what cameras look like. They can see how to act in certain environments. And, you know, that is a huge thing. And just want to give you your flowers for, you know, being that dedicated father. I don't know. I appreciate that. You know, my, my, uh, I'm blessed that my, my two daughters really don't care what I do for a living. Like they don't get caught up in, in the entertainment celebrity aspect of what I do. They only, they only care when they can specifically benefit themselves. So if I can get them tickets to a show or, you know, and, and they don't want like tickets to shows that I go to, they want like, you know, pop music or whatever, you know, stuff like that, you know, uh, Olivia Rodrigo or something like that. Right. They don't, even, they don't care about, you know, the stuff that I, I do. So, you know, I get to be like a regular guy when I'm home with them and whatnot. It's not about any industry stuff. Like I, and I've even offered, I've offered to take them certain places or, and they're like, nah, I'm good. I'm like, really? Like you guys are like, I would think that they would want to, you know, jump on that. Nah. And so when I took them to that video shoot, that was more that they were just kind of bored, didn't have anything else to do. And I was like, well, you know, just come with me, you know, you know, real quick. My oldest knew who one take Jay was and, and whatnot. But if you notice, they were like way out of the mix. Yeah. They weren't trying to be in the scene. They weren't trying, they were way out of the mix. They did not care. Facts. But something that you're doing is is creating a foundation of like, hey, if they do have an itch in the music industry, it may not be the same taste in, you know, the same type of music, but it's a growth in that field of there's exposure. If they want to get into acting or if they want to be behind the scenes of a TV, like or a camera. Uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of a room to see exposure because, you know, a lot of us growing up, we don't have that ability to see what is in the box. We just see what's presented to us. Exactly. Very true. Very true. And, and, and the thing is, is one of the best things you can do as a parent is just expose your children to many things to see, you know, what their interest palette may be. How it digests. Absolutely. Absolutely. And embrace it. You know, the greatest gift we can give our children is not money, it's time. Exactly. And your presence with your time. Exactly. I got a quote. Let me know how this quote relates to you. If it doesn't, the idea is I want you to talk about it. Here we go. Luck is the product of hard work. Nip the great, Nipsey Hussle. Um, I agree. You know, um, you know, the thing is, is as you work hard, right? If you get up and, and you show up for yourself every day and, and you know, you, you put in the work, you put in the preparation for whatever it is, you put in the knowledge, you know, the you know, research, you know, um, whatever you do for yourself every day, right? when those moments of fortune happen, because that's what luck is, right? The moments of fortune, you're prepared. Like you're, you know, you're, you, you know, cause you're already in the midst of, you know what I'm saying? You're already in the midst of, right? So if you're working hard and whatnot and a moment of fortune happens, you're already in the midst of it. It's, it's, it's kind of like, um, you know what I'm saying? Like I, I watch a lot of boxing, right? I'm gonna give you a quick boxing analogy. So sometimes, you know, they set up a fight and in right before the right before the fight happens, one of the fighters has to drop out because of, of an injury. They injured themselves in, in camp. So when they get a replacement, it's the person. It's always someone who's already been working on uh, another fight. They've already been preparing for another fight right now. And so now they have this opportunity to step into this to this new to this new fight, this new opportunity. And you know if they pull off the upset, like it's you know it, it can be a career changing, um, you know moment you know for you and whatnot. Um, and uh, I believe, you know, that's that was actually kind of the start of Manny Pacquiao's career is that he became a replacement fighter for a champion fighter and ended up knocking out that champion fighter. And then Manny Pacquiao went on to have this incredible you know, career. It. And so he was preparing. Right. He was working hard. He was in the gym working hard and whatnot. Moment of fortune, you know, you know, presented itself luck. And then he was able to you know take full advantage of that. Who I like the bar, how you put that in perspective, because. A lot of the times, you know, when you get a boxer and, and if anyone has never seen boxers, the coaches, the trainers, they call all their boxers champ. And that whole thing is to portray in their mind, no matter what, they're a champ. And it just gets them to work towards that goal. And, you know, athlete mentality, you know, you want to be better than the next person because that's the whole point of being an athlete, that you want to be the best you can be. And it allows you to have that growth. And boxing definitely, it, it, it trains you from the beginning to put the mentality right. And if you work for it, you can get there. And no, nah, that was a perfect analogy. Talking about the entertainment game, did the game choose you or did you choose the game? Um, uh, it chose me. Um, 
you know, it definitely chose me. Actually, early in my adult life, I tried to stay away, um, try to do the the regular guy thing, you know, family, you know, marriage, kids, job, all that. And it was just too evident in, in my life that I was supposed to participate in the entertainment business um, on the business side of entertainment. And um, yeah, no, it definitely chose me like this is definitely um, a calling, uh, you know, purpose. Uh, it's not just because I like it. It's it's like I almost like was destined to have to do this. You know what I'm saying? So it definitely it definitely chose me. When would you consider that first confirmation that the music business industry and, you know, directing people's careers is what you're supposed to engulf your life into? You know, I don't know if I ever had a moment that that if I, you know, in the in that moment, it stood out. But it probably was a moment that actually ended up being bad for me, like, you know, some bad business happened to me but I was, I was right. Um, a few years ago, there was a group that had a single with Jeremiah called, um, um, I forgot what the name of the song was, but the, the group was called Drop City Yacht Club. And they had a single that did pretty well, uh, that did fairly well nationally uh, with Jeremiah. Um, I actually put the group together and the original name of that group was called The Freshmen. They were from the Bay Area. There was two, two white rappers from, from the Bay and then the producer was THX from LA. And I put that group together. And I was behind them uh, early on and whatnot. Uh, when I, like I said, constructed the group, I was, you know, trying to be behind them, um, you know, investing in them and whatnot. Uh, and then other people kind of got into the situation and whatnot and kind of like elbowed me out and whatnot. But they ended up then signing a deal with um, one of the Sony labels. I forgot which label at the time it was Columbia or, or RCA. Um, and then having that record and having some success and, that was confirmation that I was right. You know what I'm saying? And like, I was right. I, I saw the vision, I put it together uh, and whatnot, but you know, the business did me dirty, which the business, you know, will do from time to time. Um, so I didn't get a chance to participate in any of the success and whatnot, but the members of the group later when they, you know, when we, when they ran into me later on, they realized and they apologized and they realized what I had done for them and, and, you know, what, um, you know, the vision that I had, I was right and whatnot. And so that was probably the first time where I was like, I was right about something, but I took a, I took a loss at the same time. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And it's important to recognize that that loss was a lesson. And you obviously you see that like a bright, a bright stone that's, you know, on the ground and you picked it up and, and you didn't think twice about it. It was, Hey, this is how the game goes, but my ear was sharp and I found something. And then you also did the next step. You put it together. A lot of people can find things, but they don't put it together. You can hear Soulja Boy say he found Chief Keith, but he didn't sign him. And it's just like that moment of, hey, you did something about it. Sorry about that. No, it's all good. But no, that's, you know, that is the music game. It's, it's gritty and grimy at times. That's why. That very, very much so. Growing up in the IE, it was a hub of diversity, a melting pot of ethnicities and culture. How did that impact your movements in the music game and to your success? What's funny is actually, I feel it's the opposite of that. I feel like there is no culture, there is no diversity out in the IE, uh, which is why I love being in more of a, the LA metropolitan area. You know, and I've been in Long Beach for 20 some years at this point. Um, because of the culture of, of, you know, what the city, you know, has. What the IE gave me um, and my parents moving out there when I was in the sixth grade, uh, and I say from the sixth grade to, uh, to high school, I mean, to, to senior year and I graduated, is it gave me um, the ability to get out of the mix at a, at a very, you know, uh, at a tough time, in the LA area, right? As far as like, you know, raising kids and things like that, right? So they removed me from that and I was able to have a very safe, solid upbringing, right? Um, and I could just worry about getting an education and things like that and, you know, focusing on going to college and, and whatnot. And so that's what, you know, it gave me was um, a, like a bubble, right? It gave me this bubble of just worry about being a kid, you know, just worry about, you know, doing kid stuff and whatnot. 
I don't have to worry about the other aspects of, you know, social um, uh, things that, you know, you know, people my age were going through at that time. It's funny. Uh, Bible. <laughs> Glasses Malone and I often, you know, me and him are very tight. We're good friends and we're about the same age. And we often talk about how we had similar experiences because like we, we love the same albums. We grew up in the same music, all these things. But because he grew up in Watts and I grew up on the IE, we had different trajectories, right? So he went the gang banging, drug selling route and whatnot. I went the, college, you know, going, you know, getting a, uh, you know, finishing high school and getting a, um, a college degree route. You know what I'm saying? Because of the, the environments that we were in that allowed for that, you know what I'm saying? So although like we're very similar, you know, as far as how we ideologies, how we think about things and whatnot, we had very different trajectories because of the environments that, you know, we, we were in. And so that, that's what I take away the most was that I had options, you know what I'm saying? The mm -hmm. suburb and the IE gave me options that a lot of people don't always get. You know, the reason why I did word it that way is uh, I was talking to Blast's mother at the Six Tape 2 documentary and release party. And something she said is that she moved Blast out of, you know, the Crenshaw area into the IE because it, it created a different element of just diversity because they were so used to social survival that, you know, it, it puts a, a guards versus being a kid. And then it allowed him to see other ethnicities if, you know, without it being a, a where you from type of atmosphere. And then it allowed him to be a kid, just as you said. So it, I thought that was really dope how you were able to parallel somebody a lot younger than you and classify it and it has the same trajectory and growth. Exactly. Because you are right. The streets, the streets do, you know, call the community at times. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's, you know, it, it's hard not to be involved, even if you try not to be involved. You know what I'm saying? When there's, if there's chaos out in front of your house and you just try to go to the store to get some milk, you got to walk through the chaos. You know what I'm saying? You're going to be, gonna be involved in the, you know, in the chaos. There's just no way around that. And so um, that's why people are, are, are products of their environment. That's why that's a real thing, being a product of your environment. And so, you know, um, you know, hearing, like you said, last mom talk about that, that was, the, that was the point, right? Was to put him in an environment so that he, he could focus on other positive things. You know what I'm saying? That was the reason why my parents did it, so I could focus on positive, you know, positive things, you know? I've been able to give my my kids, you know, a little bit of both where they they grow up in Long Beach, but we live in a very good neighborhood. Um, but then they go to school now that they're in high school with kids that are in different going different neighborhoods. So they get some of that. Oh, OK, you, you're from this part of Long Beach and you're from that part of Long Beach. And so they can get a little bit of education in culture in that way. But where they live, very calm, very quiet, very safe, you know. They know, and they know that they live in a very privileged bubble and whatnot, and are very appreciative of that. Amen. And it's a blessing. I mean, that's the whole point of why we get out and, and do what we do so that we can create those environments that we didn't have to, you know, strive through. 100%. What, uh, I gotta know, I feel it's always somebody mm -hmm. invests an idea or puts someone in a position to reach their dreams. Who do we owe to thank you for investing into your sleepless dream? Nobody. I mean, except for my mother, you know what I'm saying? You know, I, I just, I was blessed. I'm one of those people who was blessed with, you know, incredible mom and whatnot, as far as just, you know, believing in me. And, and, and I, I call my mother, my angel investor, right? Um, because the, the investment that she made in me to, you know, be the best person I can be and, 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 and whatnot. And a lot of times, you know, people give me a lot of credit for the gems that I, I drop and things like that, but they don't realize that that comes from, you know, years of me and my mom just having conversations back and forth and, and whatnot in the game she gives me. And then when I became an adult, the game that I give her in return, you know what I'm saying? Now, now it's a very reciprocal relationship as far as advice and counsel and, and things like that. But as far as like anyone in the industry or anyone else, I, I was definitely mentorless and I was looking for much. See, the thing is, is I was one of those people I was looking, I was looking, I was looking to for someone to put their arm around me show me the game, you know, all that, and was never afforded that opportunity, which is why I'm so willing to give game to people, have conversations. You and I have had many conversations, you know what I'm saying? Um, when you've had, you know, questions or, or what have you, I'm always looking to bless people with insight, information, you know, advice, counsel, whatever I can, because I was not afforded that. So everything that I've learned 
I had to learn the hard way. I had to learn kind of like the back door. You know what I'm saying? I was never let through the front door of, of any opportunity or, in, or industry. I had to kind of, you know, reverse engineer a lot of situations and, and all that. And, and, you know, really kind of like try to get it, you know, you know, trying to get, you know, the, you know, the hard knock, you know, aspect of trying to learn things. And so I was not, I was not blessed with a mentor at all at any point in my life. I mean, I'm being very honest, never, which is why I go so hard to try to mentor other people. You know, I want to make sure we have this Snoop Dogg moment because he had that album. I want to thank myself and I want to make sure that, you know, we relate that moment to you as well, <laughs> because yeah. a lot of the it, time people people want a, a hand to be lowered, but sometimes you got to climb the wall no matter what no matter and what. get that view because that view is only to be digest once you climb. And if you get a help up, it's a blessing, but you got to work twice as hard to stay there versus when you work twice as hard to climb up. You get to enjoy it more and know that your purpose is settled. Exactly. Such a good point. What has been, point. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. What has been one of your most rewarding moments in the game so far? Um, the most the most rewarding moments by far, and I've had some really great moments, was uh Chuck Dizzle and DJ Head being able to be homegrown radio on real 92.3, you know, Monday through Saturday night. You know what I'm saying? Um, that was never like an expected uh, goal uh, at any point in our working together. And when they got that call last year that they were gonna be the official night show um, and it was gonna be homegrown radio and whatnot, that was a moment where I was like, yeah, yeah, you know what? It was kind of like that, that, drop city yacht club kind of thing but th but in this one i fully was able to participate i was fully in place and and those two really appreciated all that i had been doing with them for the last 10 years to get to that moment and whatnot so that's that's undoubtedly probably the highlight of my professional career thus far mm, that's a syndicated moment hell yeah on the flip side as we go from the highlight i want to go to the low on people you know but they got misunderstood or fucked up. What is something people got fucked up about the music industry in LA? Um, well, they have fucked up. Well, there's a there's a there's a thought and an ideology that people don't want the LA sound. That people don't like the LA sound, right? Um, and that's a that's false. That's not true. Um, they actually do like the LA sound, you know, DJ Mustard uh, or Mustard is, you know, still probably one of the most uh, important and sought after producers in the game. He doesn't work on as many, you know, albums and projects as he used to because he's very successful and he can pick and choose. But when he does, you know, he gives them one of them once, you know, every time he gives them one of them once and, and it's always our sound and whatnot. And, and you can look at you know the success and then when you look at the success of even someone like a Roddy right a lot of people say they love Roddy because he doesn't sound like an LA artist and whatnot but one of his biggest records you know outside of the box his two other biggest records are high fashion and and uh balling right which are very much LA records very, very much LA sound obviously mustard records and, and you know whatnot even this newest record he has uh you know um late at night, you know what I'm saying? Another mustard record. And so that's the probably the thing that people have us most fucked up is that they they say that they don't want our sound. They do actually love our sound. They do want our sound. Other artists come here to get our sound and whatnot and get our imagery and our and our lifestyle and all that. Um, we as an as a local industry just need to make better, you know, quality records and what, whatnot. You know, take the time to really produce our records, take the time to really do the business behind our, our our artists and our records, and so on and so forth. But that that idea that ideology that people don't want the LA sound or whatnot is just completely false. It is absolutely false. You know, I want to make sure I shout out Mixed by Ali, Derek Ali, because that brother has definitely changed the way we hear music and the the energy and how that mix is is done. So that what you're trying to get across from the beat to to your vocals. Is, is definitely there in energy and, and feeling and emotion. And that that is LA. You can't go across any billboard record without going across something Ali has touched or oh, what. Undoubtedly. Undou undoubtedly. And that's LA. 
Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, and, you know, he's touched, you know, everything from, uh, I mean, he touches a lot of industry stuff, but then, you know, he does all of YG stuff. He does Roddy stuff. He does, you know, he had done, I don't know to what, to, to what point now, but he had done, you know, all the TDE stuff and stuff like that. So yeah, you know, Summer you know, Walker, Don Tolliver, Nardo Wick, Nipsey's victory lap, Nipsey victory know. lap. Amen. And, you know, that's just something that people just they sleep on. And, and I'm happy you brought up all those those great things because people do got the sound of L.A. fucked up on how they project it and what it really is. Very much so. And it's in it, in it. I take it personal. So, you know, a lot of my work is is to support and help help, you know, uh, to be like you said, to be an ally and fight for our, our sound and our business. That's right. That's why I was banging your line. And every time I seen you, my face lit up like a smile. Like I had Colgate teeth. No, and I don't. But that's just the energy you bring because it, it, it's, you know, an ally that you can trust and that you can build with no matter what. Because this game definitely has so many shadows and backdrops. It's good to know someone that has been through that level and, and knows like, hey, you know, this is how to maneuver so you don't fall back too far. You know, it's OK to fall, but it's, it's important to get back up and recognize the distance you got to travel to get there. Yeah, exactly. I got to know, what's your favorite Snoop Dogg memory? Whether it's in person or his music has done for you. I got a, uh, I, I, you know, I've got a few. His music changed my life. So nothing but a, the, the, when I saw the video for Nothing But A G Thing, that's what changed my life. That's the moment I fell in love with hip hop. And that's when I knew I wanted to be in the business. But my favorite memory probably is, a, it's kind of more of a, like a personal one. So, um, one of my, you know, good friends is Chuck Dizzle, right? And his wife, uh, her name is Tasha. She's a, she's a chef. She has her own catering company called Yummy Creations. Um, while she was pregnant with their child, um, there was an opportunity to go to Snoop's Compound for an, uh, for an event. Uh, I think it was a Black Panther um, DVD release. And I think they were going to do like a, a makeshift uh, drive-in movie theater, right? Um, and so she was in our group chat saying she wanted to go, but nobody else was going to go. You know, we'd all had kind of done other Black Panther activations and whatnot. So no one was going. And I was like, I was available to go, but I didn't really want to. But she said, Soup's my favorite artist and I've never met him. And I'm like, wow. So here's the problem. She's eight months pregnant and her own husband can't take her, right? Ooh. So I'm like, I was like, all right, I can take you. Now, anyone who knows, you know, you know, pregnant women that bit, you know, that far along, you know, they can almost be almost any in any day as far as, you know, having a baby and what, having the baby. So I'm like, man, I got to get this woman back to her husband ASAP all in one piece. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I'm like, I had to take responsibility for a little while. But anyway, so we go to the compound where um, there, you know, there there people are gathering and whatnot. Snoop gets there and he's walking around and he's taking pictures. And I'm like, you want to go, you want to go meet him? She says, yes, but no. Like she was too nervous, right? I was like, no, nah, no, nah, come on. So um, he's taking pictures, whatever. And I get his attention and I'm like, Snoop, I have your biggest fan right here. And he saw her, he's like, oh my God. So he walked up, gave her a hug and everything. And I'm like, yo, let's get a picture real quick. So she didn't even expect to get a picture. So I made sure she got a picture and all that. And he was, you know, who has ever met Snoop? He's such a gracious celebrity. You know what I'm saying? loves his fans, loves the people, takes the time, all of that. And, you know, he's, I think he had said something to her and whatnot, and she just couldn't believe that she had this moment, got the picture. We saw, we ended up watching um, Black Panther, you know, via, you know, um, in the car and whatnot, and I got her home. But that's probably one of my favorite memories just because um, she had never met him. And uh, we had, like I said, we had this opportunity and she got a great moment and great picture. That's right. That's right. And, you know, if those that don't know, Snoop is, as he said, the most gracious person, celebrity, the biggest celebrity icon in the hip hop game right now. And he he's still gracious and humble every time you see him. And I like to say he still is the same man because he'll put you to sleep if you hang out with him long enough. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Now, Brian, brother, you have made it through the show. And before we close out, you know, let them know where they can find you. Shout out what you want to shout out. Do your thing, player. So uh, all social media is my last name, Salas, S-A-L-L-I-S-M-O-N-E-Y, Salas Money, Money. Twitter, uh, Instagram, what have you. Uh, You know, you could contact me on any one of those uh, platforms. Uh, I'm accessible. I'm always down to, 
you know, chop it up, you know, have a conversation, you know, what have you. Um, and then just looking forward to all, all the things working on for 2022, you know, wrapping up this year and then going into next year strong with, you know, all the projects, you know, that are working on and, and putting, and putting together. So, you know, just, I'm always busy, always working. That's right. That's the motivation. As you told me on the phone, you got to put that work in that gym. All at all times. You hear me? Times. On that note, it's Contrast Uncut. It's season five, episode 43. I got to give a huge shout out to Uncle Snoop's Army. Shout out, dog. Bobby D presents. I appreciate you, brothers, because I wouldn't be able to do incredibly dope shit like interview Brian Salas. So this brother did talk about money, the money of the game that you can enrich if you just listen to this brother give you those gems. His tongue was made of diamonds and he let them carrots fly today. Whether you got the chance to get them or not, all you got to do is hit rewind and tap back into this interview. Brian, blessings on blessings on blessings. And I can't Thank wait so to much. talk with you again. Have a good one. Peace.